I've been working in seasonal prediction or actually looking at the dynamical seasonal predictions for the last 20 years, and I thought I'll put out some, pull out some uh, things we have learned, and they might be helpful in uh, designing and and looking at the, the framework for CMIP6 and the decadal prediction or experiments you're trying to uh, put in there. So what by mechanistic, I don't mean in anything about mechanism. This is just very um, simple in the sense that uh, so everything in the prediction side or on the, when you're do, doing the predictions, the basic thing is the, what the scale is going to be. And, and that depends uh, entirely on uh, what the signal to noise or the prediction, prediction problem is. And once knowing the signal to noise, there's a lot of implications on how, how big the ensemble size should be and what's the impact of a, uh, a finite ensemble size or finite verification time series on the, on the estimates of the skills are. And that might be helpful uh, for you in designing the, or putting together the experiments in the, 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 the same six, so how long you want to have the decadal prediction how, over how long a period, how long, uh, how big the ensemble should be, uh, and, and things like that. So, so that's what the mechani mechanistic uh, refers to. The, everything is determined by, on the prediction side, or the, getting the, the skill, uh, what the signal to noise is, and that, uh, controls what the predictability in the system is, what the prediction still skill would be, or how much of the prediction skill you can realize, uh, amount of work you need to do to realize that predictability. So if a signal to noise is low, you have to spend a lot of, a lot, huge amount of work to get out a small signal, but at the same time, the, the skill of prediction is going to be fairly low. So, so uh, almost everything depends on uh, this key quantity, what's the signal of the thing you're trying to predict, and what's the what's the amount of the noise uh, where it is. And this, in fact, is too. We know if everything is random, but it's a very hard fact to assimilate in your thinking and, and come up or be realistic about it. Uh, so very non-technical definition. Uh, I'm just putting it here for the, the, for the signal. It's our ability to distinguish the forecast outcome. So you have ensemble of perturbed state. From initial conditions, you make the forecast. Uh, and from that, uh, how much the forecast, the PDF of the forecast differs from the climatological PDF, and that defines the signal. Uh, you can look at the various moments of the uh, PDF. The signal could be in the shift in the PDF as the mean, or it could be change in the spread of the PDF, or some of the other moments of the PDF, sorry. Uh, the noise is the, the non-uniqueness in the forecast. So you're starting from a, 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 in a perturbation of various initial conditions. How fast these perturbations uh, diverge from, the, uh, from each other as the forecast lead time increase, increases, uh, determines the, uh, how unique or non-unique the forecast is or what's the noise level in the forecast is. So the combination of the signal and the noise uh, governs all the properties of, uh, of the skill or estimating the skill or getting the skill of the uh, system during the forecast, how long what the verification time, time series you need, how long the verification time, you, time series you need, and the same ensemble size, et cetera. And it is a very basic feature of the dynamical systems and comes from the sensitivity of the system to uh, perturbations in the initial state. Now, this is a diagram from the 65 Lawrence paper. When he stopped the integration and went home, came back, restarted the forecast from a Initial conditions he saved, and he got two different art outcomes, and that led to all the uh, subsequent papers he had, and and all the things we uh, understand about uh, chaos and the butterfly effect. Uh, hopefully, you have read. If you have not, just it's very worth reading these two couple of books in uh, on the popular literature. They're very illuminating to uh, go through. So just an illustration, uh, a schematic part. So a blue curve here is suppose your climatological PDF of any quantity at any place, any vertical level, or any variable. Uh, you take a, uh, choose the initial conditions for the different components of the earth, earth system, uh, generate some perturbations, and start to integrate those things. As the lead time increases, the, the spread among the forecasts or different ensembles starts to increase. 
Uh, so the signal is, is uh, some measure of how uh, different this forecast PDF is from the climatological PDF. Uh, in this case, I just indicated the, the difference in the mean and the noise is the, the non-uniqueness in the forecast or the how, how much is the spread in the, uh, during those forecasts. And you can see it, I mean, we see it in the seasonal forecast all the time. This is the plume of the Nino 3.4 SST index starting from very slightly uh, different initial states. There are 40 different curves here. This is actually for this particular event. And the spread you're seeing is equivalent to what's, uh, how the initial perturbation is spreading with time. And the noise is how much the ensemble mean uh, in this, I'm just defining it that way. How much does the ensemble mean differs from the, the climatological mean, which is the zero state here. So the ratio or the relative amplitude of the signal and this noise will determine what the scale of this prediction is going to be. The, the smaller is the signal, the smaller is the ratio, or the smaller is the signal, or bigger is the noise, the smaller is the scale would be. Or you can just take a, a ratio of this uh, differences from the climatology in the ensemble mean versus the spread, and that tells you what the scale of this prediction is going to be. And there's a very simple theory behind all these things. Uh, you don't even have to use models, and you can come up with all kinds of measures. How the scale varies with the, uh, how the expected skill is going to vary with the signal to noise, uh, how the ensemble size is going to influence the uh, estimate of the skill of the prediction, uh, how, how the influence of the length of the time series over which you do the uh, verification influences the, the skill of the uh, skill you're trying to estimate. So you don't have to go through any models. You can just write I mean, all these things you can derive on a half a piece of paper analytically. And this does lead to some very eliminating results. So this is an example of what the expected scale uh, is going to be. There are two different measures. The left curve is for anomaly correlation. The right curve is for rank probability skill score. So this is a scale for a deterministic forecast. This is a scale for a probabilistic measure. The x-axis here is the signal to noise, uh, which is a ratio of the, the difference between the the mean of the PDF you're trying to forecast in the climatology, and the spread is, uh, uh, is just spread is the, the spread between the forecast. So this is the ratio on this x-axis is the ratio of the, this signal divided by the noise. So this is the x-axis, so uh, at, at this go, goes from zero to three, so it's saying the standardized anomaly of the signal to noise is going from zero to three. Uh, this is the expected value of the anomaly correlation. And it's a universal curve for any time scale prediction. All you need to know is what the signal to noise is, and you basically would know what this uh, expected scale of that prediction would be. And it's for perfect model. There's no actual model involved. The so theoretical results could be derived on a piece of paper. <laughs> so for zero signal to noise, the expected value of anomaly correlation is zero. It climbs up, and for high, very high standardized anomaly, it reaches one, as you might expect, and very intuitive results. Uh, same thing happens for probabilistic measures. Uh, for zero, signal to noise, the rank probability score is zero, goes to one. The shape of these curves depend upon which skill score you're looking at. So the, the functional dependence, how this curve climbs uh, from, from zero value to the one value depends upon which kind of uh, skill measure you're looking at. So, Rank probability skill score is much more punishing. So if you take signal to noise one, this value is only 0.4, while anomaly correlation uh, is probably 0.7. So this is, if you want to feel good, this is a better measure to verify your forecast against. Uh, the probabilistic, probabilistic scores are much more punishing in, uh, in terms of signal to noise or what the skill is going to be. So this is the basic thing. The more interesting part is uh, what's the, so, um, so you, have, you don't have infinite ensembles or, or very long time verification time series. So in the Degegel prediction, you're working with probably a sample of 30, uh, ensemble size of five to 10. So the question is how these skill scores vary uh, with the ensemble size and with the, uh, in the verification time series. So here's an example uh, for dependence of the ensemble size and uh, reduction in skill. Uh, this is the same as the previous plot. This thing is dying out. Uh, and in this plot, again, the x-axis is, x, x is again the uh, signal to noise standardized anomaly. But now uh, the skill score here is, so this curve is based on an uh, infinite ensemble, a very large ensemble. 
<laughs> but you have only, if you're only working with the ensemble size of one, then the reduction in the skill relative to this curve, uh, reduction in the expected skill based on ensemble size of one forecast uh, is shown here. So this is, uh, the skill of this forecast would be this much less than uh, what this, this curve is. So it's an anomaly, anomaly correlation. Uh, both are for anomaly correlation. So, so this is the reduction in anomaly correlation uh, for if, if you have a finite size ensemble. Again, it's a theoretical result. Uh, there's no, no modeling or anything involved. So if you have ensemble size of one uh, and signal, signal to noise is zero, in fact, there's no reduction in scale. I mean, you just don't have any scale. It doesn't matter how big your ensemble is. You work with one, one member ensemble or 100 member ensemble, you're still going to get a zero scale. Uh, if you're on a region of the high signal to noise, uh, so the skill is one, the reduction is still, or the change in skill, the reduction skill is very low. So for very high signal to noise ratio, you can get away uh, with ensemble of one and still get the expected scale. And it does happen. And you can see it in the signal prediction in the tropical latitudes where the signal is very high to SST. You can have just have ensemble of two or three. You can still very, make a very good forecast of upper level height or things like that. Uh, so this is going for ensemble size of one, two, three increments of five, one, three, five, seven, da, da, da. And by the time, uh, so the maximum gain in skill comes where somewhere around uh, signal to noise between 0.5 and one. The one message here is that uh, going beyond uh, ensemble size of uh, 10, you're basically not gaining any much more uh, usefulness in the forecast. And, and again, you can draw this curve for uh, different uh, measures, so things for uh, curve for RPSS looks very similar. Uh, one message here is that for for high signal to noise ratio, uh, when the skill is high, you don't need very large ensemble. For low signal to noise, uh, you require larger ensemble. Uh, there's still the skill is improving as you increase the ensemble size, but you're sitting in a region where the skill is very low, so it's not it's not really going to help you. You can put a lot of effort, make a very large ensemble, but the end result you might approach a a skill limit which is very low to begin with. Uh, same thing happens for if you're doing a verification over finite time series, uh, again the same curve and for anomaly correlation. Uh, what is shown here in this case is, so you, you make a forecast, uh, let's say you have a sample of 10, uh, a forecast observed sample over 15, 15 years. Uh, and then you, and there is, for each signal to noise, there's a spectral le level of skill, but you do this verification over and over um, based on a finite time series, so that estimate will vary from one sample to another. And this is just the standard deviation of that uh, variation in skill uh, around this expected values. Uh, so in this case, uh, although uh, the, the previous plot is saying that even if you have a small ensemble, there's no change in skill, uh, if you were in the low signal to noise ratio, and if you're doing a, a forecast over 15 verification cases, your skill is going to vary a lot. So here, uh, the expected val value is supposed is 0.2. The standard deviation in the skill could be larger than what the expected skill is. So you, using a short, short verification time series, uh, you're doing the hindcast over 20 year period, uh, you have 20 cases, you go back and verify it against, so that measure of skill you're going to get is going to have much bigger variation than the actual value of the skill is going to be, which you don't know actually. Uh, for higher signal to noise ratio, I mean, smaller time series are good enough. Uh, you can get away with that. But uh, <clears throat> I'm imagining that here in the decadal prediction, you're sitting somewhere in these uh, regimes of the low, uh, low signal to noise ratios. So what are you doing based on a short time designing the experiments based on a short verification time series, 20, 30 year hindcast, and that's going to generate a fair amount of uh, error in the estimation of the, the, what the expected skill will be. Again, this, this can be, this is for anomaly correlations, you can get the similar uh, curves for the, uh, any other skill measure. So you can um, advance or you can, uh, push this, this argument a little bit further, and there is a sort of a complementarity. We can reverse the argument, uh, which is basically saying the harder you have to work to get the skill out, the, the lower the skill is going to be. And, and uh, 
Uh, just, just write, uh, there's no equations or anything, but this is just coming from the, from the results here, uh, if you look at the, how these things depend uh, on the, the signal to noise or, or on, the, on the finite ensemble size in the verification. So uh, high, high predictability regimes where the signal to noise ratio is high, you're going to require a small ensemble size. Low predictability regimes requires much larger ensemble size, but the skill, again, is, is already limited. Uh, you cannot go beyond what the small value of the skill is. And the very need that you have to do the ensemble basically sets up an upper limit uh, on the skill. Otherwise, you'll be doing a deterministic forecast. You don't even have to worry about the, the perturbations or anything. So the very perception that you think that you need larger ensemble, and it has come up in the various maybe couple of talks before, that ensemble size wasn't very big, 10 is not enough, I mean, we need 30, is basically implicitly pointing to the fact that uh, the skill is going to be low. And so it's a very typical example. So this, this figure is from Horan Wallace, 1982, uh, based on 2025 years of data. It's still valid uh, after 30 years or more data, and this signal was easily, very easy to capture in the observations and in the, in the GCMs, and whatever it was, uh, the, 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 and these, uh, this is the impact of the end. So again, uh, plot is from uh, Rupleski and Halpert back in 80s, uh, and these re re results have withstood the time. And the reason for that is because signal is very high, and you can you can do this uh, because you, even with a small time series and and, and a small uh, uh, small data and anything. So one implicit reversing the argument, one implicit. Uh, uh, statement here is the more you have to work, the, the, the bigger and bigger ex ensemble you're uh, experiments you're designing, all this good to understand the physical mechanism, the implication is that you're chasing very smaller, smaller and smaller amount of uh, prediction skill and, and predictability in the system. Another thing you can do or, or learn from the, the seasonal prediction is, and this, this, is, this has also come up in the uh, has come up in the talks before and probably come up. Um, there's, there's no absolutely no relationship between the potential skill and the and the actual skill. And very easy to demonstrate is that or argument you can follow is let's say the model total model variability is approximately same as observed variability. So you take the the variability of five year time means in the model, compare that with the observation. Let, let's assume uh, they are same. What you don't know is what's the split between the signal and noises. Uh, this is much harder because in observations you cannot do that. In the models you can. So although the, let's say the, the total variability is similar, uh, it's hard to come up with what the split between these two is. But you can imagine two, two scenarios uh, when the, the, model, the signal in the model is larger than the signal in the noise. And because the total variability is similar, by definition, the noise part has to be, in the model has to be less than the noise part in the observations. And it can show that in this case that if you're doing a, a measure like anomaly correlation, you do the verify the, the, the forecast signal against the observations, which has both, uh, both uh, signal and noise. And you can actually show that the anomaly correlation for the model in this case would be greater than the anomaly <laughs> correlation when you verify it against the observations. In this case, perfect, perfect but the potential scale would be larger than the real scale. But you can really e very easily run into a scenario, or you can imagine a scenario when the signal in the model is less than the signal in the observations, and to compensate this constraint, the noise is more in the model in the than in the observations. And in this case, the the potential scale is going to be uh, less than uh, actual scale. So it all depends on how is the total variability splitting in the signal to noise, both in observations and the model, and to, and to argue that the gap between the potential skill and the observed, or the actual skill is a, is a measure of room, room of improvement is not a, uh, it's not that straightforward and, and could be a, a chasing something which doesn't exist, uh, or maybe just because the moral biases. Two minutes, sorry. Okay, so just three more slides, uh, and this is something, uh, it'll, you might consider in terms of designing the experiments for trying to actually estimate uh, what the skill of uh, decadal prediction is going to be. So very basic fact is extratropics, uh, in, in extratropics, atmosphere drives the ocean, and atmosphere is very chaotic. 
So it's basically wise noise converting to the red noise in the ocean or the land surface boundary conditions. The real question is then how much is the white, white noise constrains the, the red noise evolution of the uh, atmos red noise evolution of the chaotic atmosphere because that determines in the, in the initialized prediction what, what the skill or the signal and noise going forward is going to be. So you can convert the white noise to the red noise, but if the ocean is not constraining the white noise evolution of the atmosphere, your, your initialized predictions are not going to succeed. Uh, so uh, this is something you, you can design actually experiments to, to be able to uh, analyze this thing or come out with uh, what, what this, this constraint of the red noise ocean on the white noise atmosphere is. Uh, so the, this, this slide is just illustrating the atmosphere leads the ocean. Uh, so these are very standard diagrams. You take the, some, some measure of the PDO index in the atmosphere, uh, correlate that with the corresponding uh, ocean fingerprint. Uh, there's the lead lack correlation between the, the atmospheric PDO and the oceanic PDO. The, the correlation is higher when the atmosphere leads the ocean and the moment uh, ocean leads starts to lead the atmosphere, the correlation drops. And this is kind of telling you what the constraint of the red noise ocean on the white noise atmosphere is. This is a result from a Russ Davis's paper in 1976. Uh, and this curve is what this curve is. And basically telling you the same thing. That atmospheric, when the co correlation with the atmosphere and ocean is higher when the atmosphere leads and drops when the, uh, when, when the ocean starts to lean. And this is a 30 year results. Again, it keeps come showing up over and over and over again in any, any of the analysis. So the implication of this thing is um, you, you can do a very long control run. Uh, you pull out the, what the, the relationship between the atmosphere and the ocean is, and this is just the EOF analysis. Uh, we have seen it a lot, so this is uh, done from a, uh, I won't go into detail, but this is equivalent to a long control run. You take the atmosphere, you take the ocean, do the EOF of the atmosphere or the SST, come out with the PDO fingerprint, get the corresponding correlation between them. And this is what will happen, but this does not imply that ocean is forcing the atmosphere because this is coming from basically atmosphere forcing the ocean. What you actually need to do is to take a control run, pick out the high PDO states or high AMO states, initialize the predictions from there, do the ensemble mean of those predictions, and then see uh, if you have this signature in the, because this is the red noise that evolves on a slower time scale, so if you have this signature in the ocean, what's the corresponding signature in the atmosphere? So this is drawn from a seasonal prediction hindcast system. And these are initialized forecasts. So this is the relationship between the, the surface temperature uh, and the ocean. Uh, sorry. OK, so the, 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 the colors are the uh, surface temperatures over the ocean is SST. Over the land, it's the land temperature. The contours is the height. So these two go together. Uh, in fact, this height actually is forcing these uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. If you bypass the atmosphere, it looks like, it may look like that this ocean is forcing the atmosphere, uh, sorry, this ocean is forcing the land temperature anomaly. But what actually happens is that bo both of these are, have apparent connection because of what's happening in the atmosphere. So this is this kind of thing you can get in the, uh, so these are based on individual runs uh, in a seasonal hindcast. So this is a sample of about 500 cases each, a very huge sample. And then you actually look in the forecast uh, where you, uh, when you're starting the forecast from a high PDO state, and then you actually do the forecasting and compare these two panels. This is from the same data, but initializing the individual runs, uh, but this is based on uh, and the forecast of the ensemble mean. So you're starting your forecast from this SST state, uh, it's slowly dying away, and it's merging towards the climatology as, as the persistent time scale will go on. And then uh, this is the corresponding atmospheric response. And in most cases, the response in the atmosphere will not look like uh, what you will get from an individual run basis. And this is something you can design in the runs you are proposing that take each for, you can think about doing a 200 year control run, pick out the SST states, uh, which corresponds to high PDO or high MO, start a perturbation of forecast from there, and then see how the ensemble, ensemble mean evolves towards the, uh, how the ensemble mean evolves and how does it compare uh, to the, the relationship between the individual runs. Uh, because this is a, is a consistent or simultaneous relationship. How much of this is a force relationship, you can only gather it out of ensemble mean, and that you can 
I, I think you can do some experiments and uh, try to pull this apart. Um, those are some uh, papers. Uh, this material is drawn from these papers. Uh, if you have time on clinician, you can read these things. So I'm done there. And in the meantime, you can read this. OK, for a couple of questions. Um, the, the concept about low signal to noise ratio requires a high number of ensemble members. And at the end, you get low skill. Yeah, you're bound to get low skill. Can that be transferred to decay prediction where the trend produces a large amount of scale? Yeah, so I mean, if trend is producing large amount of scale, you should be able to pick that up in few runs. It's the hard part is the, the variability around that. For that, you need large ensemble. And if you do need large ensemble, I can almost tell you right now that scale is going to be low. Because you, otherwise, you won't have needed a large ensemble to begin with. But trend part, you can pick it up in a, in a smaller ensemble. But that's not what you're chasing here, I think. Matt, so uh, in your uh, that simple analysis, if you, <coughs> if you had a simple linear drift in the system, which you remove it every time, so you would get the same result. But if you had a drift which was slightly random, I'd say the magnitude of the drift was slightly stated, you didn't really know that. Could you uh, mistake low skill or low signal to noise for a case where basically you just don't have very much more and has drifts? Has what? It has drifts. So the model drifts away. So in seasonal prediction, you don't worry too much about drifts. Oh, come on. That, that's one of, the, one of the biggest headaches we have is the, is the drift. In fact, one of the biggest headaches in seasonal prediction is how to initialize over 30 years and keep the, keep the ocean land in a consistent way. Okay, so how do you just deal with that? We try to do with the hindcasts. Do you think that the results will go of your simple analysis would be the same in the case of the I need to talk to you later. I don't quite get the question. Maybe you can ask it again or put it in a different way. Or... OK, in, in, your, in your simple analysis, you're basically assuming you have a perfect model, right? Yeah, it's a perfect Maya. So if any errors in the model, then you get, get into a situation which is much harder to. Yeah, so what I'm saying is you know, you're saying that the decay problem potentially low signal to noise and low skill. But could that be just because we have models which have drifts? It could be, yeah. I mean, I don't know. So yeah, so take my statement with a grain of salt that, I, that if you're working hard and skill is low, that may be because your models have so much biases too. So you quantify that with your, your framework by including a drift You could. Uh, you could put that as an error. Yeah. It's probably doable, yeah. George. Um, just speaking about this particular topic, I mean, when you do use simple kinds of of, of verifications like quantity correlation in the case where there's a deterministic trend plus variation about it. I mean, I think you can show that you get a better correlation score if you over predict the trend, for instance. So it's not a trivial matter. Bad, better actual skill or better, better potential? Better actual skill. Okay. Maybe we should look at a different skill score then. Yes. More than one, then some skill score will pull, pick that. Yes, exactly. Anomaly correlation may not be sensitive to that, but if you do a probabilistic measure. So yeah, so I mean, you can, these curves are there for every skill measure. You can, it's very easy to quantify, I mean, quantify these things, sir. So on your comment that um, you say if you need a large ensemble, then you're not going to have any skill. You're going to have very low skill. So I think I would take issue with that. No, sure. Um, that, that's true if, if, your, if your model, if your ratio of signal to noise in the model is the same as in the real world. But, yeah, yeah. But there's emerging evidence in, in the, that, that actually the signal to noise ratio can be bigger in the real world than it is in the models. And therefore, yeah, so there's a, a right. Song, you get rid so, of all that noise and you can have a very, very skilled. No, 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 no. The getting rid of the noise is the, is the part which only helps up to you to a point. I'll show some results tomorrow on that. Uh, if observations have a larger signal and noise, and if your model work close to reality, they would have picked it up. The reason they may not be picking it up because they have biases. 
Yeah. So, the, so that's a different issue. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering about sampling problems. So we get up with this, so we just kind of sample every five year or every year. But we also choose our sample size. So I, I'm just wondering which is better if we try one ensemble member but every year or the ensemble member with every. Well, I, I would think ensemble, ensemble size of 10 is fairly adequate, so maybe go for a longer time series. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you're doing a 50-member ensemble, you already know the noise is big. That's why you have to do 50-member ensemble. The noise in the model is big. Noise in the model. Right. Then, then you shouldn't be using it bad. But you don't know what's, hap what's in the observations, right? I agree. I mean, that's a research. Okay. That's a different question. We'll return to this tomorrow. And that's, um, All right, thank you. Bye.